a great time of year. And I guess there's a certain times in your life where you, you, you look back at, at the summer months and there are these memories. This, this next guest of mine, uh, who also is closer than a sister, and we were talking about this. Is this is this closeness that we have is is been a thing of beauty for over, well, I'm going to say almost sixty years. Probably is what I'm going to say now. I have to say it out loud. That's terrible. But for myself and Esther Herbert, who's about to join us, when we think of summer, our memories would be shared because the first thing at, that comes into my head, the town park, the the park, the park, the pool, the yes. tennis courts that you and I played on all the time. Uh, getting gum at that 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 concession place that they used to, to have there where you could get you know all the all the junk that was uh you know you find a quarter on the ground on church street i am running to the park because i can get chocolate or gum uh but the heat at the town pool remember the heat of the concrete when you jump out of that freezing cold water i they said the pool was heated i don't think it was ever heated <laughs> maybe by 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 body heat by enough children jumping in there and whizzing in it i don't know where the heat came from but I don't know if it was heated. But then you get that that feeling of lying on the hot concrete as your body basically sizzled in the sun. The town park was just so central for us growing up, wasn't it? Oh, it definitely was. I mean, it was a meeting place. It was something that was just, um, you know, where you wanted to be because that was that was the hot spot, so to speak. And, you know, the pool was it and the baseball diamond. And, yes, finding that quarter was gold. So, <laughs> usually for me, it's a pixie stick. I don't know if anybody knows. That's that. right, pixie stick. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, the pixie stick. Well, as I was mentioning to uh, the audience here before you came on, because we've had uh, chances to, to, to talk about mental illness, bipolar, all those kinds of things that we now – talk more openly about we are slightly more educated about it but that doesn't mean that we have all the answers uh nor is it something that is easily uh, addressed in fact it, it's far from it knowing that those that suffer from it generally their first instinct probably is to hide it which we have talked about why people have hidden it for so long the other thing and it came up in conversation the other day was medication and it's confusing for those of us who have not suffered from it or maybe don't have those in our family that, that have an understanding of what that actually means because there are some, again, who out of fear don't want to talk about medication or feel they can get by on their own without the medication. And as you've talked about many times, it took a long time in the correct diagnoses to really understand the weight of trying to get that cocktail or the balance of whatever it is addressed properly and with the correct diagnosis. But I don't think in any way, shape, or form condoning not being medicated or having medication seems to be a route for disaster. What would your response to be something to something like that? Well, Mike, Brandon, I, I want to say that um, medication to me saved my life. You know, getting that right cocktail took a long time with my doctor, you know, sometimes too much, sometimes too little, a lot of side effects. So it took a long time to work that out. And it can be frustrating. And a lot of people give up at that that particular stage. The other thing with my bipolar is that people feel that medication takes away, you know, their wonderful, fanciful uh, flights and uh, their great creativity. Um, you know, they think that they're able to write um, you know, ballads or they're writing poetry or they're writing hymns that people could sing. And, you know, they, they have all of that. They're writing short stories. And then when they're medicated, that creativity to them goes away. So that is a huge deterrent for my particular disorder. They think to themselves, well, you know, I, I don't want to be like this. So I will just either taper off or worse yet, uh, stop completely. Because that's a very dangerous thing. If you are going to stop, you need to talk to your doctor. And, um, you know, they'll certainly try to talk you out of it or whatever they suggest or something else. But um, to cold turkey this is not a good idea. Now, for me personally, I have been on my medication since I was diagnosed in 2000. And for me, it's a lifeline. You know, I, I can't stress enough that if I don't have my lithium, then my life is not going to be the same. The person that you see right here talking about mental illness, it would be a totally different person. And it would be quite uh, scary for me and those around me because you're out of control. For me, I, I'm in this parameters of highs and lows that I can function 
I've been at my current position for almost 20 years. And that's pretty unheard of for people with a mental illness, let alone bipolar, uh, because it's very, very difficult to hold on to uh, positions like that. But I give the credit to, you know, the medication, but you have to do so much more and we could get into that. But I mean, you have to follow the regime and you want to see your doctor, get blood work, do everything, exercise, do everything you possibly can to keep well. And um, a lot of people don't want to put in the effort, to be honest with you. Well, and that's th that's a great point, is that you know, uh, instead of just sitting here talking about that, there's some magical pharmaceutical that you're going to take and then magically you're going to have this uh, a perfect life. It, it really doesn't work like that. So for those that are entertaining what we've just talked about in terms of medication, uh, I, I am sure that those even listening to this morning, if, if, if they have, well, maybe it's even children, maybe it could be a brother, sister, a partner, it could be a husband, father, whatever it happens to be, the first step, I'm sure, is absolutely horrifying for those who are very intimidated about what's coming next. So for if you're if you're addressing that person right now, if you're addressing these people listening who think, you know, my teenage daughter falls into this category, but we've always been afraid about the the journey, the road it will take to a sense of, and I can't use the word recovery. What is the word we use? What what what, what is the word we want to use in this case? What medication does for someone who's uh, um, who's being diagnosed with mental illness. It's not recovery. What is it? A program? What are we, what are we saying? I, I say the word regime, program, uh, healthy track, you know, because you're going to start something that I think will, will save you in the long run. Now, there's a lot of things that, like I said at the beginning, that's very, very tough. And people with a preconceived notion about medication may not want their daughter on that and so forth. But the alternative is if perchance you have a daughter or a son that is acting out, you're afraid when they go out at night, you know, you're dreading a phone call from maybe the police, you know, all of those things. Now, doesn't the chance of a normal life and a chance of being a productive human being and somebody that the parents don't have to worry about, doesn't that outweigh, you know, the fear factor? Now, I can't talk people into medication because that's everybody's choice. They may want to do something holistic and so forth, but do something because watching your child go down a horrible road like my mom and dad did with my sister, Rebecca, she um, would not take the medication. She was um, diagnosed with bipolar, alcohol, um, drug addiction, and so forth. Long story short, she refused to take those medications, and she ended up on an um, overdose that killed her in 2013. So there's an example in my own family. So I'm very adamant about getting help, staying with it. Uh, you want to live, and you want to, um, you know, your dear parents should never bury a child, I think. Yeah, that is... Uh... <laughs> Uh, that is a very heavy story and a truthful one, but it's something I know that you do not shy away from simply because uh, in order to be effective in, in what you do and the message that you bring to people in different corporations, I should also say that as well, you, you have to be transparent in that way. Or, or I know for you, it just isn't authentic it, and it's not effective. So to talk about your sister, to talk about family, to talk about... Um, your own you know, personal struggles uh, that, you know, many people, <laughs> including this guy, were shocked to hear some of the things that transpired in your life with me, not how I didn't know. It just speaks to probably, quite frankly, your IQ and your ability to, you want something hidden. If Esther Herbert wants to hide something, you're not going to find it. Just so you know, <laughs> you just good luck with that. By the way, we are in discussion with Esther Herbert. She works for uh, the Brady Corporation, but um. She is an advocate for, you know, uh, Markham Slope Hospital, uh, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Mark Berber, who has uh, uh, and is probably considered a lifesaver in, in Esther's life. But she speaks a lot on this topic. And if you're listening here this morning and think, why well, I wouldn't mind having this person uh, speak to uh, yes. my staff via whether it's a Zoom or, or in person, uh, you know, address, um, she's available. Uh, Esther is available and she has a website out there and you can get a hold of her on her Facebook page. So that's just a little reminder about that. But the other thing, too, is just, I think in this day and age, and, and, and Brenda and I were talking about it, this is a very tough current world that we live in. Uh, and that's, you know, regardless of whether you have a, a mental illness or issues or not, just for someone considered, quote unquote, normal, whether it's COVID that came in, then you have uh, social upheaval and, and, and disdain, you have a war that has gone on 
You have the price of food, for goodness sakes. Uh, the price of like, how are they? How is this generation supposed to buy a house when the average house that you and I grew up in, homes that were built in what in the fifties? I'm guessing probably 1950 something. That I believe in Stovall, those houses would be million a million dollars. I think. Exactly. I, I I believe they would be. So, this is also a time where I also wonder about the concern because of today's weight. Is it even more important to to take these steps to make sure? Because I, I think even for yourself, because you're very open about it, there are challenges now that maybe we didn't even have five years ago. Oh, there's a, a lot of challenges. You touched on so, so many. I don't know how uh, young people especially cope, you know, because there's so many temptations out there. There's so many um, lost souls that don't really know what's going on. They don't know uh, what to do, who to hang out with. Um, you know, what to listen to. Uh, you've got so many choices these days. And sometimes, you know, one of the choices takes you down a, a dark path. And if parents, friends, teachers, whoever it might be, aren't watching, then a real tragedy could happen. Um, you know, you, when you mention about houses, how can young people a starter home, you know, for a million dollars? That's ridiculous. You go out and buy a bag of grapes, it's $15. It, I, I just don't understand how people can cope. I'm almost 60. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, what am I going to do in my retirement? You know, because that's a concern. So that takes its toll on its mental health. Everything does. You have to form relationships with people that are long lasting, um, relationships with people that are strong, that you trust, um, whether that's going to be in your own personal life or even at work. You want to have an ally at work that you can talk to. And, you know, that's huge because you're going off to work every single day. You know, you talk to Brandon, you know, and that's wonderful because you two talking about mental health. Awesome. I have people at my Brady that I do talk to and I trust like Kim and so forth. And that is awesome. But I mean, there's a lot of lost souls out there that don't have someone. So kind of be on the lookout for them because, you know, the wallflowers of the past might not be the wallflower. They may be the most charismatic person in the whole room. And they're the ones that are hurting the most. Well, uh, your company, uh, Brady, not only are you and have been a long time employee of, of that corporation, um, and they have uh, supported you and backed you in some of the most difficult times, but also in the same respect, and this is to your point that you just made, you are a vital point, part of, of what they do. You are one of the pillars that exists within that company that they're able to do a lot of things. They they count on you a lot. There, there is a significance to Esther Herbert working at Brady, but it has been nice to see that there are companies who do understand, have seen the challenges of which you have documented on this show and other shows yes. uh, that would not be easy uh, necessarily to entertain. But Brady has really done quite, uh, I think, an amazing job in the support of, of Esther Herbert. I totally agree. I mean, I, last year in May, I went um, via Zoom and talked for almost an hour to Brady USA. And uh, it was the Women's Leadership Alliance, plus a whole lot of uh, leadership people, men, women, and so forth. And the response was amazing. So when you think about a company that's going to support mental health, to have it as a topic for their whole meeting, um, that was absolutely so stunning. And I was so grateful because that's the company I'm so proud of. And that just made me even more proud because if people can talk about it in the workplace, that's the hardest place in the world for a stigma to abound. So if you can knock it down, um, you know, smash it to the ground some way, somehow by talking, uh, I think that's a wonderful thing. And I'm honored to do so. Just terrific stuff here this morning, Esther, as I knew it would be. I mean, just just really phenomenal, uh, you know, so detailed and important, you know, just these 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 uh, uh, and this journey, I guess the way I would put it, it's got to start somewhere. And as you've laid it out, you know, as scary as it can be, it is life saving. And yes. uh, there's no there's no other way to put it. Uh, terrific, my friend. Thank you. Uh, you're you. always so inspirational. I just uh, appreciate love you to death. And okay. thanks so much for this morning. And we'll talk to you again or hopefully see you real soon. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. That is Esther Herbert joining us here on the program. And as always, just a phenomenal job. Just so inspirational what she does. And uh, the charm that can only be described in one word, Atlas. And people are like, what is he talking about? The guy was just talking about gambling and booze. How is he jumping from this to that? Because that's the show. That's who, that's who I am. And she knows it better than anybody else.